Good. Well, hi, everybody. I'm KT Picard. I'm delighted to be here today. I'd like to thank the Mind First Foundation for the invitation to speak and also for the delightful week that I spent with my wife, Kimberly. We've been here in Boston for the last week. We lived here, met here 25 years ago at a supercomputing company called Thinking Machines. Back in the day, we were both software engineers uh, working on bioinformatics, it turns out. Uh, 25 years passed, and in the middle, I ended up going into a career in uh, medical imaging, uh, and I've kind of reconnected with genomics, and that's the source of today's talk. Uh, I did want to mention that I am CEO of a company that does medical imaging. It is my day job. And what I'll be talking about today is what I do personally. I don't play golf, but I do genomics. So i just let you know as a disclaimer, these views do not necessarily reflect the views of my employer. So that's my standard disclaimer. All right, but we're going to roll up our sleeves today and talk about uh, these three things. DIY sequencing and how you can do it. For those of you that aren't involved in the PGP, uh, Professor Church was talking about cost versus price. We're going to delve right into that. We'll talk about common versus rare disease. I became interested in this because of the work in genomics that I've done and a recognition that uh, amplifies on, on the last talk that Manley's talk was about data sharing. Uh, and it's become kind of a, a focus for me as well. That you can kind of do what you do, but it doesn't really, really mean a whole lot unless you can share in the context of sharing with others. So here's how we got started. Uh, Illumina, a company in San, uh, San Diego, had a program called Understand Your Genome. And their price was, as George mentioned, $5,000 per person. I was very fortunate to have that money. Both my wife and I were sequenced. And what that gave you was uh, the data uh, and an interpretation. They looked at about, I think, uh, 1,000 or so different Mendelian or single gene disorders. To be honest, it wasn't terribly useful. I was kind of expecting more out of it. But in the end, uh, after the day-long talk and having to get approval from my doctor and going down to listening to a day of talks and uh, getting this uh, questions answered by a genomic counselor if I had them, uh, what I got was a report which basically had zero findings. And uh, a, it's kind of hard to see there, but that's a, a disk drive. And that disk drive has my data on it. So the question you ask yourself is, what's more valuable, the report or the data? Now, there's some stuff down there at the bottom that talks about carrier status, and we'll talk about that a little later. When you have kids, this turns out to be something kind of important, and things that insurance companies are even helping carry, cover now. But now that I have my data, now what? Now what? Well, we have two children. I said 25 years later, so our daughter is now 18. Uh, she has high-functioning autism. I thought, what a great opportunity to use the whole genome sequences that my wife and I put together and learn more potentially about our daughter's condition. So uh, I wanted to wait until she was of age so that she could make this decision. Uh, she was very capable of understanding what was going on, kind of helped us with the research along the way. Uh, we used something called family trio sequencing. I'll explain what that is in a minute. And we were looking for genetic clues. So there's a picture that my daughter drew about, she's there on the left, about one in five individuals, about 20%, um, we can now look at their genomes and get some genomic clues to autism. So how do you do this? So here are the steps. Uh, and, and don't worry about, uh, you can take pictures of this if you want. Um, I just tweeted the slides. They're also on my blog, and you'll see them coming up. So don't too worry about too much about writing this down all too fast. All right, so here are the steps how you do it today. First thing you have to do is raise money, or you can pay out of pocket. But I thought, you know, there's a lot going on in crowdsourcing. A group called the Rare Genomic Institute out of St. Louis was doing this, and I thought, wow, there are other groups, Microbiome, Ubiome, you may know about, American Gut. These also kind of have crowdsourced components to them. So why not make use of this zeitgeist of, of crowdsourcing? So then you have to find a sequencing company. We'll talk about that. Uh, blood draws, you show up at the lab, uh, you overnight your samples, you wait a little while, get your data back analyze the results, and then you stand in front of people like this and you give a talk. Soup to nuts. This whole process took two months. So uh, it's, uh, it's something you can do and not spend an entire lifetime doing it. All right, number one, launch a campaign. So we went to a group called experiment.com. They'll be here tomorrow as part of the PG Palooza uh, as one of those participants. Uh, this is a site that, if you're familiar with um, 
oh goodness, help me out, uh, other sites, the, the Kickstarter or that sort of thing. But this one's specific to science. So I did a little video uh, that explained what autism was. Um, we, we managed to raise the, the cost of sequencing $1,750, the street price for uh, having your whole genome sequenced at 30x coverage, if that means anything to you, meaning kind of a clinical grade genome, is, is $1,750. Now, uh, the $1,000 genome may refer to what actually costs the person to actually create your data, but the street price is around $1,750. We were able to raise that money in less than 24 hours. Had a tremendous response. So, you blog about it, and there's a genome dad there on the bottom where I, I write about this stuff. Then you have to go find somebody that allows you to take your money, take the blood, and, and make a sequence out of it. So there are now these companies that act as brokers, and there are some of them up there. We chose one on top. I knew some of the people there. They hooked us up with a group in Alabama called Hudson Alpha. They had a brand spanking new uh, Illumina HiSeq X10, hottest thing on the market. And so we were able to get uh, our kids' genome sequenced through them. So here's what you do next. You have to get a blood draw. Now your doctor has, I didn't want to learn how to become a phlebotomist. So I had my doctor sign off to get a blood draw. But they said, send us the blood in these tubes. Well, I didn't have any tubes. So I wanted to provide you the link on Amazon. So if you need your own EDTA tubes, you can go to Amazon and buy them. That's what I did. So you guys are tubes. That's my daughter getting her blood drawn. And then I had to make up this little kit. Now when my wife and I went to Illumina, uh, it was all provided to us. It was all, you know, hermetic and had nice little labels and all that. So I had to make that up myself. What I learned is, if you make it look right, no one asks any questions. So if you go to the lab, be prepared. Make it look like it's a scientific sample. I've been in healthcare for about 20 years, so it wasn't too hard to do that. But there I am, my daughter and I, in a bleary eyed on a Saturday morning, holding onto my ice pack after the blood dry. You ship it overnight. And off it goes to the lab. Now, as luck would have it, a week later, we got our results back. That's amazing. They really had a lot of action. They really, they just unpacked this thing. So a week later, we had our results. This is a site called DNA Nexus. Anybody, how many people in the audience have heard of DNA Nexus? Look at this. Look at this. Anybody? OK, for the four of you that have heard of DNA Nexus, for the four of you that have it, for the rest of you who have it, it's a site where you can post uh, your, your DNA samples uh, the FDA recently awarded a big contract to this company, DNA Nexus, uh, for something called Precision FDA. And uh, Professor Church was talking about genomes in a bottle. And that's uh, one of the ways we're going to make uh, genomic medicine more safe and effective. This is going to be a platform where they're going to store all that DNA. OK. Uh, just some bits and bytes for those of you, the, the techies in the crowd. Uh, these are not small files. And it requires a whole, and I thought I'd just put it on my computer. Well, you can't because they're so big. So the files come out, and there's some technical stuff there, but about 325 gigabytes per person of data. And what that translates to in, in technical terms is that using my cable modem at home, it takes about three days or roughly 80 hours to transfer the data from the cloud back down to my computer to do analysis. So it takes a little while. So anyway, blue 12 days getting the data down for the whole family. And then here's what we do next. We analyze the results. This is uh, what we call family trio sequencing. Now, when I thought about this, I thought it was going to be more about this thing down the bottom left, uh, which uh, new variants or de novo variants. In rare disease, it turns out that a lot of things are related to these new variants. And I thought, well, that's where we were going to find the autism. Boy, was I wrong. In any event, so this is kind of skewed towards that. But it shows you up in the upper left, there's mom's DNA sequence, the whole three billion base pairs. There's my daughter's DNA sequence, and there's mine. And basically what you do is you filter out the stuff that's new for mom, the stuff that's new for never seen before in dad, and what you're left with is a pile of stuff that might be new in your kid, and maybe that would explain his or her condition. The rest of the stuff we, pull, we throw into another bucket. Some people call them accumulative variants. There's a whole different, bunch of different words for that. So here's what we did. Um, I just mentioned this de novo or new, uh, and this other thing, compound heterozygous stuff. Um, these are kind of likely places to look where things could go wrong. I'll show you the cockpit for the software that we used uh, to do that, the filtering that you go through. I was very fortunate to work with a company called Golden Helix. They donated the use of their software for the analysis part of this. So, let me be very clear about this. The 1750, the 
the $1,750 is for the raw data, okay? So the interpretation and understanding is do it yourself. It's left as an exercise to the reader, okay? So again, I heard earlier $1,000 from Veritas. Boy, I'd love to see you know, what's included in that uh, you know, for interpretation. So many people have talked about um, $1,000 genomes and, and, and that's becoming cheaper, but the analysis and the interpretation is still, I've gone back to school over the last five years to kind of get my chops, right? So I kind of I figured that out. All right, well that produced diddly squat. So I'll walk you through that in a minute. So the second thing was you look at um, databases that, uh, are, that have genetic uh, genes and genes that are correlated with uh, autism. And I'll show you a few of them. Uh, between two and 700 genes in each of these databases. And I didn't have a lot of time, so basically for me that was a lot of Excel spreadsheets. And looking at an Excel spreadsheet, looking at my daughter's genome Excel spreadsheet, no. So I got blurry eyed after a few nights of that. And the third thought was, why don't I look at the kind of usual suspects for autism, the so-called hot spots, and there's some spots on chromosome 16 and some particular genes, Norexin, NX, NRXN1, uh, are highly associated with autism. And that's where I hit pay dirt. But before I get you there, I don't want to cut to the chase. Here's that uh, little uh, kind of cockpit, if you will. It's a little hard to read, but from left to right, it's walking through uh, de novo candidates, and there's about 40 of those. Uh, compound heads, there's about 10 of those. Um, recessive stuff, nothing there. Uh, there's something called the uh, ACMG, the American College of Medical Genomics 56. Who's heard of that? Okay, that's a good number. So um, there's a reportable number of genes that uh, these folks are saying if you have a variant there, you should probably get the results reported back from your doctor. Autism is way off the map on this one. And uh, there were three of those. It had nothing to do with autism. So. Uh, 51 or, you know, when you combine it all together, 50, whatever it was, all together, no help. Step two, as I mentioned, I looked at autism gene databases. There are four kind of good ones there. One starting the list uh, in alphabetical order here at Harvard. Um, one out of uh, Kansas. A nice series on gene hunting in the Lancet a few months ago. And then one I love, the Simons Foundation. I think they're in New York. And then what they do is they curate genes associated with autism and they give them ratings. So it's kind of like the Russian judge, and you know, they all go through it. It's kind of nice. All right, so here's Pager. I want to show you what Pager looks like. Now, bear with me as I walk you through this if you've never seen a, a, a gene browser before. What you're looking at here from bottom to top, uh, there's mom's genome. Across the bottom are what we call pile-ups. So that's uh, all the, the coverage as it's coming through. So for every spot on my genome, I have an average of 30 different spots. And uh, across the, the gray line, then, is kind of an aggregate of all that. Same thing for me. And this is the spot on chromosome 16 that I mentioned, that deletions in this area of the genome are highly correlated with autism. And what do you got up there? You've got my daughter. Proband is just a fancy word for someone who's affected. And there's nothing. I mean, there's, there's a genomic desert. And it just goes on for thousands of base pairs. So I do want to caution that this is preliminary. These results are preliminary. Uh, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, I learned a lot of things along the way. Um, but anyway, that's kind of exciting, uh, exciting number one. Number two was um, this norexin uh, gene. Uh, norexin is a, is a gene that's used for uh, synapses and uh, making them uh, conduct. Uh, what you see here, and this is a little hard to, to, to visualize, but again, mom has this little kind of purple band in about half of her pileups. Dad has about some purple banding, kind of a vertical band, about half of his. And those are uh, kind of these, you kind of think of it as a... Uh, a homozygous insertion. Anyway, um, uh, and so our daughter gets it fully, and so there's, there's, uh, she gets the whole, pretty much her whole thing is, is, is an insertion there, and she picked up basically, you know, half from mom, half from dad, and it affected there, and gives her some extra base pairs to worry about. Even more interesting was this deletion. Uh, again, you can see it in mom, the purple there in the bottom is, you know, she has a few pileups that are deleted, dad has a few, and you look at our daughter, and it goes across eight or nine base pairs there. And you can see there's this kind of, uh, I think it's a GT, GT, GT repeat. And the idea here is what's happening is that those base pairs have been removed, theoretically, because they're kind of looping back on each other, and, and that's how they get deleted. And uh, again, uh, a gene that's highly correlated with autism. So some take-home lessons and to-dos, and here's the one I'm going to talk about. Always run your samples through the same pipeline. 
And what we mean by pipeline is that the, so the set of software has to be the same for all your, all your samples, so that they get called the same way, uh, so that they get, anyway, so they all come out the same. Even though the equipment was all built by Illumina, the software pipeline really needs to be the same. And these were, again, done about a year apart, so the software pipelines were different. So I have to go back and rerun everything to make sure. And then I'll go talk to some really smart people who know, who know a lot more about this than I do to confirm these results. Beware of the false positive de novo variants. There are a lot of uh, kind of goose chases there that uh, weren't, weren't very helpful. Uh, pay attention to carrier status. As I was mentioning, you, you, may be, you may have one good part, one good gene, and, and the other allele is not so good. It turns out that kind of like half-functioning stuff, I think we're finding more and more diseases uh, or conditions where having one functional, one non-functional actually ha makes a difference. An example would be my wife. Uh, she, in her genome, found that she had one functioning allele for, uh, for fructose, and the other one was non-functioning. Non so what it shows up in her report as is that she's a carrier for this. And you say, well, as long as they don't have a husband that's a carrier, and we don't, you know, our kids and, you know, the Punit Square and all that, uh, then we probably won't have any problems. Well, it turns out that uh, she's changed her diet and has uh, improved dramatically uh, her health just by removing fructose from her diet, even though she's, quote, a carrier. So pay attention. That's what we learned from that. This last one uh, performed copy number variation analysis. It turns out that, again, a lot of people with autism have uh, parts of their genome that are copied over and over again. The analysis that we did did not include that. So I need to go back and do that. So I wanted to morph in a little bit now about data sharing, more on autism, and the reason that I believe that uh, sharing is so important. Um, here's a picture here on, the, on your right of uh, Temple Grandin, um, probably the, the poster person for uh, the autistic community as someone who was profoundly autistic as a child, uh, subject of a movie. She was portrayed by Claire Danes. It's a wonderful movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, most of us have seen Rain Man or have that concept of what uh, autistic people are. Uh, this is, gives you a nice perspective. Um, the point of the slide is to show um, that autism has uh, prevalence around the world. As I mentioned earlier, 20% explained by genomics. Uh, between two and three people in the United, sorry, two and three million people in the United States affected by autism. Arguably, you could have six different, you know, along the spectrum, six, six different types. You break this down. So about 300,000 people per type. Bear with me, there's a reason for, for going through this. Another uh, condition, schizophrenia, the late John Nash, um, uh, diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia, a very famous mathematician. Um, a, a paper that uh, was contentious when it came out, but it claimed that through genetics we can now subtype schizophrenia into seven or more types. So you go through the math and, and uh, about three and a half million people, or about 500,000 people per subtype. And finally, diabetes. Across the world, 4 to 40 percent of the folks who have diabetes. Uh, interestingly, the folks over in Saudi Arabia now, a prevalence of 40 percent, uh, did not exist one or two generations ago prior to the introduction of the Western diet. So a lot of money being spent on genomics in uh, the Middle East on diabetes. So a uh, paper here classifying diabetes into 30 different types. Uh, you have in the U.S. about 30 million people affected. Um, about one million per type. Why go through all this math? The reason is that these are com relatively common diseases. When you look at these common diseases through the lens of the 5,000 or so hospitals in the United States, what you find is that on average, people that walk through the door end up looking like they have a rare disease. In the United States, we define rare disease as anyone at a group of 200,000 or less, or roughly down at the bottom, rare disease is one in 1,500 people. So the, the point of this slide is to demonstrate that there are conditions out there that seem relatively common, but when you start looking at the subtypes, and as we learn more about the genetics of these uh, conditions, people that walk into the, any door of a, of a random hospital end up looking like uh, a, a rare disease patient. Why does this matter? It matters because a lot of hospitals will tell you I'm going to use the genomic data that I collect to help me decide the best thing for my patients. And if I were a patient, the last thing that I'd want was to be known like a rare disease patient and having the, this, only, you know, this corpus of knowledge that only my hospital knows. So this is a cry for data sharing. And it, it ties on with the, with the last talk about the importance of it. Uh, access ownership and all that. Um, here's a little cartoon. Your previous provider refuse to share your electronic medical records, but not to worry. 
I was able to obtain all your information online. So we have some concerns around, um, or I'm not going to get into the whole access ownership debate. Uh, there's been, boy, it's gotten hot recently in the last few weeks about you know, access to your data and ownership and property rights. Don't have time to get into that. But I do want to talk a little bit about who wants your genome, okay? And we've been talking today about where you can share your data. This is amazing to me. So we were talking a second ago about hospitals and how they have their own fiefdoms. And I've seen this. They, 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 they have believed that um, having information was a proprietary advantage to them. What I fear is that we have, most of these are kind of uh, open. It's relatively easy to put your data into these, uh, into these places. Um, they're going to, again, bump into uh, the same issues unless they all start sharing. And this is about 20 different groups uh, that um, all are willing to accept either you know, your genotype from you know, 23andMe or a subset, all the way up to your whole genome sequence. So there are lots of people out there that want your data. Okay. So how do we make them useful? Now I'll bring up just two organizations. Uh, the PGP you've been hearing a lot about today. Uh, another one I wanted to draw your attention to is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. PGP participates very actively. Uh, what I like about them is that they address lots of different issues, including ethical issues uh, around data sharing. Technical, of course. Um, so these are, there's some uh, sources down at the bottom, but these are folks that are working to find ways that internationally that people can share things so that we all don't look like a bunch of rare disease patients walking around when we aren't. So in summary, I want to let you know that personal genomics is real. Um, um, some of you are participants in the PGP for, I think many of you raised your hand saying you'd like to have your genome sequence. Uh, you can go through what I've done and, and roll, you know, roll your own. It's possible. Uh, I think it's a lot like homebrew computers were in the 1970s. Uh, so when you kind of went to the computer club and you brought, hey, I, I made the circuit board, I found this was a very coll collegial environment. And so I was able to share with people. Uh, they were very willing to help. Hey, my daughter has autism, and these are the results that I found. Uh, and that's where we are right now. As this, as this industry codifies, uh, as it ossifies, um, it's going to be harder to do that. But where we are today is it's, 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 very, it's a very gentle uh, time. Um, some dark alleys, but not all. Uh, I think I found some uh, beginnings of some insights into our daughter's autism. And I think it, it provides a lot of hope. A lot of people with rare diseases, we talk about uh, diagnostic odysseys. Diagnostic odyssey means that you've seen every doctor in the country, you still don't know what's wrong, what's wrong with your kid. Through whole genome sequencing or the smaller exome sequencing, uh, sometimes we can start to find answers. And there's a lot of comfort that comes in, oh, I can point to that and say, that's, that's what it is. I have a name for that. I may not have a cure, but I have a name. And then finally, as I mentioned, data sharing is critical for insight. I can't stress this enough. And I hope I've been able to provide uh, some examples of, again, common disease and, and showing why rare disease uh, is not where we want to end up being. So I'd like to say thank you for uh, joining me today, and uh, I appreciate your attention. Thank you.